All right. In this series of videos, we're going to talk about uh, learning. So there are different ways that learning takes place. There's an associative process and then there's a non-associative process. We're going to focus on um, the three associative processes of classical conditioning, operant conditioning, and observational learning. These are the three broad uh, sub uh, subcomponents. Uh, each of these uh, have significant uh, impact on therapy. So if you ever hear someone say cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, the behavioral piece likely involves some aspect of um, conditioning involved with it. Now, I use the word conditioning, which I want you to use as a synonym for learning. So here we are. So if we were looking to define the concept of learning, uh, learning by definition is any relatively permanent change in behavior, uh, thoughts or emotions that's due to some kind of experience. And I said there's an associative and non-associative process, but we're gonna focus on associative learning, which occurs when certain events are linked together. And what we see with classical conditioning is what is being linked are two stimuli, right? So you're gonna see the unconditioned stimulus and the conditioned stimulus, and they're gonna be paired together. We, in operant conditioning, uh, we link a response and a consequence or a behavior and a consequence. So in operant condition, we oftentimes say a behavior is shaped by its consequences. And in observational learning, we say that we learn through ob observing other people, their behavior and their consequences. And the big distinction between operant conditioning and observational learning is that uh, observational learning suggests that we can learn from other people without the consequence happening directly to us. So that's learning. Now, uh, behaviorism is the scientific study of behavior. And as a function of this, you're gonna see there's a, a, a strong emphasis on um, how behavior is influenced by the environment directly, right? And the underlying processes of behavior, we're not looking at, especially when we're talking about what's called radical behaviorism. There is no uh, emphasis on the cognitive components of this or the underlying processes. Now, there are two types of behaviorists. I mentioned the concept of a radical behaviorist, that they are radical in the sense that all they accept is directly observable behavior, whereas there's a methodological behaviorist who allow uh, for more of these underlying processes. So um, as I said, there is some disagreement in this concept of uh, radical behaviorism. Okay. So let's start with some basic principles of behaviorism. One principle is the law of association, which suggests that if two experiences are uh, linked or paired together closely in time or space, we'll be able to make an association between the two of them. So the closer things happen time-wise, the more we're gonna link them. There's another principle uh, called the law or principle of adaptive hedonism, which is the basic premise that people in general seek pleasure and want to avoid pain, right? So we're wired in general to seek pleasure and avoid pain. So let's start with our first uh, paradigm, the classical conditioning paradigm. Now, I said there are three paradigms we're going to look at. One is classical conditioning, one is operant conditioning, and one is observational learning. Okay, so in classical conditioning, 
this is a form of learning that occurs when we pair two stimuli together. Now, the two stimuli of interest are the neutral stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus. Now, the neutral stimulus is exactly that. Uh, it has nothing to do with some underlying biological process, right? It's neutral. However, when we pair this neutral stimulus with the unconditioned stimulus, uh, which is biologically hardwired, learning takes place, right? So another synonym for classical conditioning is Pavlovian conditioning, because Pavlov was uh, the person we credit for these principles. Now, I will say that Pavlov was not the only person who was describing classical conditioning. There was Bechter of, uh, we'll see, Watson is a major player. There, there are a lot of other people who talk about this classical conditioning paradigm, but we generally give the credit to Pavlov. Another synonym for classical conditioning is what's called uh, respondent conditioning or respondent behavior, because what's happening is there is some automatic response to a trigger or stimulus. So let me explain uh, what a stimulus is, what a response is, and then go through the various subtypes. A stimulus is some kind of trigger, right? It can be a trigger that we're wired to respond to, right? So it's biologically significant, or it could be something that we're not wired to that we learn through association. So when we use the word unconditioned, remember the word conditioning refers to learning. So unconditioned stimulus in this context means it's some kind of uh, biological trigger that does not need to be learned. We're wired for that. And an unconditioned response is the reflexive response uh, that occurs to some kind of uh, biological stimulus, right? So for example, the startle reflex, right? The, if I were to pop a balloon behind your head, we are wired to react to fear. We are wired to react to, um, you know, biologically important stimuli, right? Because a loud noise could signify danger. We don't need to be taught to have a startle response, right? So the popping of the balloon would be the unconditioned stimulus. The reaction to the popping of the balloon would be the unconditioned response. Notice that the response is directly related to the stimulus that precedes it, right? We also have something called a conditioned stimulus. Now, earlier I talked about this concept of a neutral stimulus. A neutral stimulus, it's not biologically hardwired, but a conditioned stimulus is, it starts neutral, and then we start to learn uh, the association between this neutral stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus. Remember, in classical conditioning, we're pairing two stimuli together. So we're gonna pair the uh, neutral slash conditioned stimulus with the unconditioned stimulus. And that which starts neutral, learning will take place. And if you're looking for a way to remember, again, condition means learned, right? Or a learning process. So a conditioned stimulus is a learned stimulus. So the impact of this stimulus only occurs because of the learning process or the associative process. Now, the condition response is also known as a learned response, right? So, and the learned response is in, in reaction to whatever the condition stimulus is. So let's start with uh, Pavlov and what he did and go out from there. So 
we are wired to react to food, right? So if I were to uh, put food in front of you and you are hungry, you are going to have some re reactions to the presence of food. And one of the things, because he did this research in a dog model, one of the things that we see is that salivation is the first thing that happens. And saliva plays a very important role in digestion. It helps you break down your food. So if I were to put food in front of you and you're hungry, you're going to start salivating. It is a natural biological process because as I said, uh, saliva aids in the digestive process. How about if I were to have a metronome ticking does that have anything to do with uh, digestion? No. How about ringing a bell? D does ringing a bell have anything to do with digestion? No, right? So before we pair these two stimuli together, there's not going to be salivation due to a metronome or a ringing bell or a flashing light or any of these uh, associations we could make. But what happens during the conditioning phase, and this is very important, right? So the neutral stimulus becomes the conditioned stimulus, right? So the metronome starts to become a predictor of the food. So we pair the metronome with the food, metronome with the food. And what happens is eventually the metronome becomes a predictor of the food. Now, if we make this pairing, what's going to happen is salivation will occur, right? So, uh, but the question becomes, is uh, the dog salivating due to the metronome or the food? Well, if we go based on preconditioning or before conditioning, salivation occurred due to the food, but not the metronome. But now that we put them together, we're not sure if learning took place. So uh, because we presented two stimuli back to back, uh, when these dogs salivate, we're not sure if it's due to the metronome or the food, right? So general principle in the conditioning phase, you're pairing the conditioned stimulus with the unconditioned stimulus. And you should put the conditioned stimulus first uh, it should always precede the unconditioned stimulus because otherwise learning will not take place, right? So we want the conditioned stimulus to become a predictor. Now, in order to test whether or not learning took place, we have to uncouple these two stimuli, right? So obviously, if we put out food, the dogs are going to salivate. That's nothing new. They're biologically hardwired. But if we were curious, if learning took place, right? Well, what we could do is present the metronome by itself. Now, the if learning took place, then the metronome alone is going to trigger salivation. Now, I want you to look at my cursor, right? Before conditioning, pre-conditioning, there was no salivation to the metronome. Post-conditioning or after conditioning, there was salivation. So there was a change in behavior due to experience that happened, right? So we can see this change. And how did that happen? Well, it happened through an association. What did we associate? The metronome and the food, right? Metronome food, metronome food. Eventually we learned metronome is a predictor of the food. Now, we didn't even have to present the food post conditioning to get that salivation to occur. And that's important because if, if we presented the food, we would be introducing a confound, right? So if learning took place, we don't need to present the food. So just to give you another example, we have our preconditioning phase, right? and this is a cartoon-esque one. We have Alpo dog food, right? That's an unconditioned stimulus 
By the way, some books will use U.S., some books will use U.C.S. Both of those stand for an unconditioned stimulus, right? So food in general is going to elicit salivation. It's unconditioned. It's biologically hardwired. How about the ringing of a tuning fork, similar to a metronome, right? Similar to ringing of a bell. Does that have anything to do with food and a digestive process? The answer is no, right? So there in the beginning is gonna be no salivation. Now what we do is we pair the neutral stimulus with the unconditioned stimulus. And this association that's happening here elicits the salivation. Now keep in mind, we're not sure whether it's due to the metronome or whether it's due to the food because we put two stimuli together. And if it's uh, if learning hasn't taken place, it's reasonable to think that salivation happened due to the food. But if learning actually took place, which we expect to occur during the conditioning phase, then the metronome itself should be able to elicit salivation. So what do we do? In post-conditioning, we present the metronome by itself, the tone by itself, and sure enough, we do indeed get salivation. So looking at this slide, if I were to ask you in Pavlov's experiment, what is the unconditioned response? In Pavlov's experiment, what is the unconditioned response? Anyone? Okay, well, it's salivation, right? So the unconditioned response is salivation. What is the conditioned response? It's also salivation, right? So we have to be able to distinguish for a test, let's say, the difference between an unconditioned response and a conditioned response. Remember, the response is directly linked to its trigger or its stimulus. So I wouldn't ask you for a question like that. I would give you options. So if I were asking for an unconditioned response, it would be salivation due to the food, whereas a conditioned response would be salivation due to the bell or the tuning fork or the metronome, right? So we're looking at what the stimulus that precedes it is as a predictor of that. So uh, that is uh, Pavlovian conditioning. Now I wanna pull up a video uh, it's a brief video to show you how it works, uh, to show you, you know, how conditioning took place in Pavlov's experiment. So let me pull that up. Pavlov's aim was to discover what caused saliva to flow. He rerouted the saliva ducts to the outside of his dog's cheek so that he could collect and measure the spittle. Perhaps, he thought, the production of saliva might be the result of a fixed nervous reflex, like a knee jerk. Mm. Yes, you note, so three on the After taking many measurements of spittle, he confirmed that the dogs drooled automatically when their tongues touched food. He called the response the salivation reflex. But his work started to run into trouble. As his dogs became familiar with the experimental routine, they started to fill their cheek tubes before Pavlov had a chance to stimulate their tongues. The dogs were learning to anticipate food. Pavlov tried a new technique, 
He erected screens so that the dogs couldn't see what was going on. Before passing meat through the hatch, he introduced a stimulus that was totally unrelated to feeding. A ticking mitrona. First, the dog dripped saliva into its cheek tube only when the food appeared. But after a number of trials, the dog began to connect the ticking with the arrival of meat. Soon, the sound alone made the dog drool. Eventually, the dog salivated as much to the ticking itself as it did originally to the presentation of food. Hold there. He did see that. Hmm? Stag of you. He called this new response the conditioned reflex. Uh -huh. Whatever the stimulus, his dogs could soon be conditioned to produce saliva. Adolf believed that he had discovered how animals learned, even in the wild. All right. So what I like about the video is it has very important elements, right? He shows these dogs naturally salivated to food. They didn't need to be taught that. But uh, in his experiment, when he paired the metronome or the ringing bell or a tuning fork or a flashing light, anything could be linked to the food and we could have a learned response due to that association. In the video, you saw the dog almost climbing up the screen to, to look for the food when uh, the metronome was ticking, when ringing the bell, even before the food came. And you also saw him go around the screen and check the, uh, the salivation tube and sure enough, the dog was salivating even before the food came. So when it comes to this uh, conditioned response, he called it a reflex, but it's conditioned response. Um, it, it happens as a function of the association. Now, you'll notice in the video, as well as in the slides prior, the neutral stimulus or the conditioned stimulus has to precede the unconditioned stimulus. It has to come first as a predictor because imagine you gave the dog the food first and then rang the bell. The dog is gonna be wrapped up in the biological process of eating that they're not gonna make the association to the sound that comes later. So, so the neutral or unconditioned stimulus comes first and that's how the uh, effective learning takes place. All right. So when we talk about the process of learning, there is what's called an acquisition phase. The acquisition phase is also known as the conditioning phase, right? So uh, in classical conditioning, that is the phase where you're pairing the two stimuli together, right? So I said to you, very rarely will learning take place if the conditioned stimulus is presented after the unconditioned stimulus. It has to come first to become a predictor so that there is anticipation. Now, uh, in the video, what was interesting is they didn't tell the backstory of Pavlov, right? So Pavlov, he was not a psychologist. He was actually a, a, a physician who was interested in studying the vagus nerve, which is our 10th cranial nerve. And he wanted to study digestion as a whole. 
And in fact, he won the Nobel Prize, not for what I am teaching you, but his understanding of the vagus nerve as a whole, right? But uh, so in his initial studies, he wasn't looking to discover this concept of classical conditioning. He was just studying the, the vagus nerve. And at, they alluded to it in a video that he ran into a problem that the dog started to salivate, right? So these dogs, when they heard the footsteps of a grad student, even that became a predictor, okay, I'm about to eat. So the dog started salivating even before food was presented, which was a confound. And instead of saying, okay, my study is ruined, Pavlov uh, took this serendipity uh, and he went with it and he tried to figure out what was happening. So if you get an unexpected result in science, you, you want to look into it and figure out what's going on. And he discovered a very important principle. But what he did, I don't know if you saw in the video, he put these screens up and um, that was more stylistic, but he put up a screen uh, that created uh, a visual block of the grad students coming or him coming. So there was no visual anticipatory cue, right? He also uh, erected what's called a tower of silence to eliminate all other sound or auditory stimuli. So because the dogs were reacting to him walking uh, down the hall or as grad students walking, he wanted to eliminate anything uh, that could be an uh, anticipatory cue. And then he redid the experiment without the dog having that anticipatory cue, except for whatever he chose to be the predictor, right? So as you saw in the video, there was the metronome, there was the ringing of the bell, there was a flashing light, and on the slide before you saw a tuning fork. Any neutral stimulus could be used, right? He even used a music box, right? So there are a whole bunch of different anticipatory cues that are unli uh, not linked to digestion that when you pair them could become a predictor. So that is classical conditioning and the process of learning or acquisition. In operant conditioning, I said it it's not stimulus-stimulus pairing, it's uh, uh, stimulus-response pairing. So you have a behavior and a consequence being linked together, right? So whatever the be response or behavior is, if you get reinforcement, that's going to increase that behavior. If you get some kind of punisher, it's going to decrease the behavior. But we'll get into the acquisition of learning and operant conditioning separately as well. So just like you can learn to associate two stimuli, you could also eliminate that association. You could uh, break that association. And the process of uh, getting rid of a condition response is called extinction. Now, when we describe it as a process, we refer to it as extinction. When we describe it as what we're doing uh, to a behavior, we're extinguishing the behavior, right? So if you read in a book, uh, they'll talk about the process as extinction and uh, the verb we're doing is extinguishing it. Okay, so how do we extinguish a, a conditioned response, right? So it's simple. We stop presenting the unconditioned stimulus after the conditioned stimulus. So imagine I ring the bell and I don't present the food, the dog's gonna salivate. Now let's continue. I ring the bell again and I don't present the food. The dog's gonna salivate, maybe a little less. I ring the bell again and don't present the food. The dog's going to salivate even less. Eventually, if I keep ringing the bell and I don't present 
the food afterwards, right? So the unconditioned stimulus is no longer being presented after the conditioned stimulus. Eventually the dog is gonna stop salivating to the bell, right? So that's called extinction when that occurs. In operant conditioning, that occurs when a, a behavior no longer gets reinforced. So if we talked about the learning process, uh, a behavior is linked with, to its consequence. So a response, consequence, response pairing. If, if there's no reinforcement in operant conditioning, extinction can occur as well. But you might ask yourself, did the dogs, in the case of ringing the bell and food, did they forget that there was once this connection between the bell and the food? Or did they learn something new? Well, we have a process to test that out. If we were doing an experiment, well, after we fully extinguished the behavior, we would give some time. Let's say we wait two weeks or three weeks, whatever it might be. And we don't present the bell at all, right? And then two weeks or three weeks later, we ring the bell again. Now keep in mind, this is a dog that stopped salivating to the bell. If the dog forgot this association, then the dog won't salivate at all, right? It'll continue to be in that uh, extinguished state. But if the dog learned something new, okay, and what could they have learned? Ringing the bell leads to food. Ringing the bell doesn't lead to food. So let me interpret that as sometimes ringing the bell leads to food, right? That would be the conclusion a, a dog might make because in earlier trials, it did lead to food and then later trials, it didn't. So what's the dog going to do if they learn that pattern? Well, they're going to salivate again. And we refer to this as spontaneous recovery. And that's exactly what happens. The dogs do. Uh, start to salivate again. They don't salivate to the same strength as when the conditioning took place, when the learning took place, right? Post-extinction, they salivate less, but they uh, we have the reappearance or reemergence of a previously extinguished response. So if we were to look at the graph, again, let's look at the acquisition phase from the previous uh couple slides ago, right? Acquisition occurred when we pair the conditioned stimulus with the unconditioned stimulus. So in the case of Pavlov, the conditioned stimulus was the bell or the metronome. The unconditioned stimulus was the food. So when we pair the two together and then we measure salivation, we get the strong salivation response, right? It goes up. So Great. Now what happens when we present the bell by itself? So the CS alone was the bell by itself. What's going to happen is because it's not uh, getting food, the dog's going to stop salivating gradually. Now I said at this point, we have an extinguished behavior. Extinction occurred. Then we give some time. We give some space, some time, and then we represent uh, the uh, bell. Now, if the dog forgot this association, it would have stayed down here, but that's not what happened. We have spontaneous recovery, which means that there's a reemergence of salivation due to the bell alone. Now, because we're presenting the condition stimulus by itself again, extinction will occur again. And by the way, through time, this peak is gonna get lower, 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 right? So the, these are the three core principles of acquisition, extinction, and spontaneous recovery. You need to know all three of these. They're very, very important processes, okay. Now let's talk about the concept of uh, stimulus generalization and stimulus discrimination. So Pavlov left it there. 
But um, John Watson, John Watson applied the principles of classical conditioning to human beings. And he found through uh, a, a famous or dare we say infamous study, the Little Albert study, that there was something called stimulus generalization. And what is stimulus generalization? The tendency to have a reaction similar uh, to the conditioned stimulus uh, when, when you have objects that are similar, right? So the conditioned stimulus uh, is one thing. And if there uh, are other stimuli that are similar to that, you're going to get the condition response as well. And I'm going to explain it because maybe right now it doesn't make as much sense. So what little Albert did was he followed the same, uh, pardon me, what Watson did with little Albert was he followed the same uh, paradigm. So preconditioning, uh, he presented a, a loud noise, banging of two crowbars together. Well, a loud abrupt noise, that's an unconditioned stimulus. And the typical response to that is a startle response, right? Is to jump, right? So that's the unconditioned response. Then he had a white rat and he had little Albert play with the white rat. Now this is a, a lab rat, it's a clean rat. It doesn't have any viruses or what, uh, whatever. So before pairing the two stimuli, Little Albert wasn't afraid of the white rat, but what did he do? He presented the white rat and then smashed these crowbars together. Presented the white rat, smashed the crowbars together. And eventually, Little Albert became afraid of the white rat. But not only did Little Albert become afraid of the white rat, that would be no different than have loves conditioning study. What we found was little Albert became afraid of anything furry or fuzzy, anything that had a similar texture as the white rat, uh, anything that had a similar color as the white rat, little Albert became afraid. Now, little Albert was an infant in this study. So how do we know that little Albert was afraid or not? We watch based on his response, crying, moving away from it, whatnot. And sure enough, that fear of the white rat became, became generalized to a bunny, a brown bunny, because it had the same texture, Santa Claus mask, because it had the same color, uh, and so forth. Now, so that's stimulus generalization, the ability to generalize a uh, a conditioned response to things that are similar to the conditioned stimulus. Now, stimulus discrimination is the opposite. That's our ability to distinguish between our conditioned stimulus and other stimuli, right? So the ability to make a difference between, okay, this is different, that would be stimulus discrimination. Now, I wanna show you this experiment or parts of this experiment as well, uh, let me pull that up. So this is a very brief uh, video clip. Again, this study was done in the 1920s. So it's in black and white and there's really no sound. Uh, and what you're seeing is John Watson over here and Rosalie Rayner over here. And this is little Albert, the baby. And what you're seeing is the, the white rat, right? So here we go. Is it playing? Can you see it? No. Oh, well, there it is. Okay. All right. So he's putting the white rat. Little Albert's curious, um, not really afraid. But now that there's a association happening, the pairing, and 
after the association happens, look at little Albert's face. He's starting to cry, starting to move away. Now, this is the stimul stimulus generalization piece. This is a bunny. It's not even white, but it has the same texture as the white rat. So little Albert became afraid of the bunny as well. So what that was showing you was this concept of stimulus generalization. They didn't show it in the video, but there's also uh, a part where uh, John Watson puts on a Santa Claus mask and starts crawling towards uh, Watson. Uh, pardon me, he starts crawling towards the baby and uh, the baby starts crying as well. So when we talk about stimulus generalization, it wasn't just the the white rat that he was afraid of. It was anything furry or fuzzy. Okay, so you might ask yourself, well, why does classical conditioning work? Now, we, we talked about this concept briefly. We talked about the principle of temporal contiguity. When things occur closely in time, you're going to have learning take place, right? So pairing two stimuli together closely in time, you're going to link those two. And that's what happened with uh, Pavlov, right? With the bell and the food. That's what happened with Watson when it came to the, the white rat and the crashing noise of the crowbars. Uh, you have this association that happened very close in time. Now, there is a gradient. So the farther away things happen in time, the harder it is to link the two. So if you're going to engage in some conditioning process, um, you're going to, you're going to make need to make sure the two stimuli occur very um, close in time. Now, Rescarla offered an additional explanation, not just that these two stimuli occur in, close in time, but there becomes a contingency, right? So the conditioned stimulus predicts the unconditioned stimulus, whether it's going to occur or not occur. So in the case of Pavlov, ringing the bell became a predictor of food occurring. So it's that anticipatory cues that happens. So that is uh, what's going on there. So that conditioned stimulus becomes part of or linked up with the unconditioned stimulus. So the two explanations we have are temporal contiguity and contingency. Now, there are some constraints on classical conditioning, we have to recognize that in order for learning to take place, the animals have to be able to learn when to expect the stimulus. And that requires some cognitive processes, right? So that the predictability of the outcome is important uh, in this case. So if, if the animals don't make this uh, connection or they're not able to expect the unconditioned stimulus, then learning is not going to take place. Now, there are other things at play here too. So our thoughts can weaken associations as well. If we were to look at the process of extinction and spontaneous recovery, there's cognition happening there saying, okay, well, the food didn't come. What does that mean for this relationship, right? We also have to understand the biological predispositions. So um, certain stimuli are easier, easier to pair with others. So for example, um, pairing uh, food and uh, the bell are, are easy right? Because uh, it's an AV stimulus. Another example is if we were uh, with uh, pain 
and we were to do a flashing light similar to lightning, uh, that would make it easier to, to link as well. So it's important to understand that not all associations take hold the same way and certain uh, linkages are easier to occur. So let's talk about it. And this is important, uh, a very important uh, application. One of the biggest problems people say uh, as cancer patients is that uh, radiation makes them nauseous, right? So uh, that's biological, right? So uh, what they did uh, was they harnessed it. Now, before I tell you about what John Garcia did, I want to actually add a little bit more. Um, people who develop this nausea lose their appetite. And what we see people undergoing radiation, uh, they oftentimes stop eating and they drop weight significantly. And what do they uh, stop eating? Pretty much everything. So what Garcia was trying to do is trying to understand uh, how to, to fix this. So he did a study where there was this uh, very strong tasting um, food prior to the radiation. And then that led to pairing that specific taste to the radiation. So yes, you still get the nausea, but you only get it to a uh, specific food. So uh, in, in the animal model, he would use something that was an artificial sugar uh, of whatnot. But in a human model, we could use something like mint chocolate chip ice cream. Now, mint chocolate chip ice cream, if you like it, maybe you don't want to get rid of it. I understand. But if it's something that's okay, but you're willing to get rid of, it's a perfect candidate uh, for something to continuously eat prior to going in for radiation because it has such a distinct, strong taste that it's easy to link with the radiation. And that nausea, which is also, also wired or linked to taste as well, is only going to be activated with mint chocolate chip ice cream, but you're not going to have the same weight loss that you would ordinarily have, right? So, so this is a, a good thing. This is a good uh, strategy. So, um, yeah, so he demonstrated nausea and food are linked, right? They're biologically wired uh, rather than something else. So uh, he used some very strong taste and that led to conditioning better than if he had a sound or a flashing light because uh, digestion isn't routinely linked to sight or sound. Now in Pavlov's study, he was able to condition it. But in this case of nausea, you want something that's linked to digestion, such as food or taste. So that's more biologically adaptive. All right. So uh, this is a good place uh, to stop. Uh, the next mini lecture is going to be on operant conditioning. So let me stop the recording here.